Hey, thanks for tuning in to Busting Beaks and Chasing Tales. I'm your host, Todd Hogan. With me is Brian Johnson, and we've got Greg Staggs on the line. How you doing, Greg? Hey, I'm awesome, guys. How are you? Doing good. Hey, uh, want to get you on because you are a man of, of uh, a wealth of knowledge. So um, we're going to talk a lot of stuff tonight. Um, some saddle hunting, public land hunting, um, trapping. You do it all, don't you? I do, man. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a dad who introduced me to the outdoors at a very, very early age. And and I just fell in love with it and, and have never walked away from being outdoors and, and pursuing all things uh, hunting and fishing and things like that. So, uh, yeah, absolutely love everything about the outdoors. Cool. Uh, you and I had talked about it before, but kind of tell me again how you got into bow hunting, because that's a cool story. Yeah, you know, uh, it's something that I would have never thought growing up. You know, I mentioned my dad introduced me to an early age. This is a cool story. I've never told it on any podcast or anything else. So I was about, and then we'll get into bow hunting really, really quickly. But I was about seven or eight years old, and my dad loved a frog. So I grew up in the, the Boot Hill of Missouri. So if, if any of your listeners are, you know, if they're all across the country, and, and we're all from Missouri, right? And Missouri is, if you look at it as a square state, on the bottom right of Missouri is a little piece that sticks down in Arkansas. And we call it the Boot Hill because it looks like the hill of a boot, right? And, and there's there's no forest. There's no national, you know, there's not really big public land. There's, there's no deer. Well, there are some deer on the floodways now, just a, few, a series of ditches that they cut through to, to drain the, the farmland, right? But back then, there was no deer really or anything. So my dad grew up there, and he loved a frog. I mean, like, go out and gig frogs, right? And uh, that was his thing, dude. He wanted to introduce me to that. And I was, this is the first time he's ever really going to take me out and do anything cool with me, right? And uh, it's, I'm seven years old, eight years old. We get a 10-foot John boat. Mama drops us off, goes, and dad falls in, you know, five, six, seven, eight miles down the ditch, leaves the truck, <laughs> springs him back to the, you know, it's that whole thing. You know, I'm seven years old out there in a the pitch dark, scared to death, you know. And I got, so we, we take a frog, and dad is just so excited about introducing me to frogging. You know, he's got the big one million power, candle power frog light going up and down looking for frogs. We gig a few. And for some reason, I, I've never been a sick kid. I've never, I bet I can count on one hand the times I've been sick in my life. That night, I got sick as a dog. Sick as it started throwing up over the side of the boat. I mean, I was just sick. <laughs> We had to stop about halfway through and walk at the point that would have been closest to our house. We had to walk about two miles to our house, and I was just sick. Of the dog. We got made it home at about midnight, barely made it to bed, crawled in. My parents tell the story to this day is they're like, Dad was scared to death. I was never going to want to do anything in the outdoors again. He, thought, he ruined I, I ruined him. It, it, it was a horrible experience. He was sick. He won't ever want to do anything outdoors with me again, and it couldn't have been further from the truth. I literally fell in love with the outdoors. So that's awesome. That was my first exposure to the outdoors, and just sick as a dog, and wanted all I could get of it. So, uh, so, so yeah, that's we grew up in a place that didn't have deer, right? I mean, we frog, we rabbit hunted a lot. We had beagles growing up. Dad always had a couple beagles, and and every Saturday morning. Uh, it's so funny because once you get on face, you know, Facebook came about after we graduated high school. I probably was out of college. I, I'm sure it was. And, uh, you know, then you start reconnecting with some old high school classmates and stuff. And people realize how much I hunt and fish through my Facebook profile and, and what I post on Facebook. And I had an old classmate that goes, dude, I had no idea you really hunted that much. <laughs> I was like, uh, we hunted every weekend, uh, you know, sometimes in the middle of the week. I mean, and we were not, we, we loved it. We did it for enjoyment, but we were also providing our own food. We grew up really, really poor. My dad worked in a factory for 37 years. No, he, he got a high school, uh, well, he got a high school diploma. My mom got a GED. We lived in a two bedroom house. It's probably 600 square foot. Uh, you know, my dad probably never made more than $35,000 his whole life. I mean, we grew up fairly lower middle class to low class, right? And and we needed those six, seven, eight rabbits a, a Saturday that we killed. Dude, that, that helped us get through the week. And so we hunted hard and uh, I've eaten more rabbits than, you know, if, if someone wanted to give me a rabbit today, I, I don't know if I could eat it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I ate so many <laughs> rabbits growing up. Uh, man, I love shooting them. And I got really good at shooting them with a the shotgun. Really good. And, you know, Dad and I, was, I mean, we got so good at it. Like, okay, if you're not putting the holes in their ears, when you go pick him up after you've shot him, and he could have been running 35 miles an hour ahead of a beagle. You know, I don't think a rabbit can run that fast. But, 
you know, they screech across a cotton field or whatever. And when we went and picked them up, if he didn't have holes in his ears, we were disappointed because we got to where we could leave them and shoot them up front to, so we didn't mess up the meat, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you, you start thinking about things like that when you're poor. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's how I grew up, man. I just grew up doing that kind of stuff. We fished for, I mean, we didn't turn, if a, if a, you know, a bluegill, goggle eye, green sunfish, you know, pumpkin seed, whatever you talk about. If it was more than four inches long, we're taking it home, that sucker home, and eating it. You know, and that's just <laughs> everything. So, uh, so yeah, I'm sitting. I graduated. No, you know, no one in my family had ever taken a college class. Now, I'm not talking about getting a college degree. I'm talking about taking a college class, a class. And uh, you know, no high school counselor ever talked about me going to college. My dad worked at a factory. No one thought I would go to college. It's just, you know, no one. Just I was a fairly smart. I probably carried a probably a three two average in high school. Just I, I had a lot of common sense. I didn't study. I, as soon as I got out of school, I went, you know, grabbed my BB gun, went to the ditch and shot birds and stuff, you know. And uh, di ditch is what we call creeks for you guys that are from this area. And uh, they, so they're just diverting the waters off the fields, right, down in southeast Missouri. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So so you know, I'm sitting around school. I did join the National Guard when I was 17 years old. Got my parents you know, signature to join the, the guard early because if you were before 18, you had to have a signature. Joined that, went through military police training, all that, came back, sitting around for, for about four or five months after graduating, came through, you know, military police school and all that. And it was just the National Guard, so it was just one weekend a, a month gig, and I'm, I'm just bored. Hardy's had called three times. And uh, I'm like, I'm not going to go to work for hard. I mean, not that that was beneath me, but I'm like, okay, that's not a career option, right? And so I'm sitting around thinking, and I'm like, I'm thinking about all my friends and people that I knew that went to high school. I'm like, man, a bunch of those guys went to college, and they're not that much smarter than me. If they did it, I can do it. That was literally my thought process. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there one night. Dad's reading a paper after getting home from work from the factory. And I remember to this day, I was like, I think I'll go to college. And I remember the paper he was reading went, Ksh! he's like, what? I'm like, yeah. I know some people have done it. That's going to cost me money. Yeah. And it was it was like August. My wife was a former admissions counselor at Southeast Missouri State here in Cape Girardeau. And she's like, I was the nightmare student because it was August. School started in September. I I never heard of an ACT test. I had none of that stuff. I mean, I didn't know what an ACT was. And uh, we had to struggle and go and talk to people and jump through hoops and got admitted into school that year in uh, 1988, because I set out, I graduated, so it might have been 89, because I did not go the first year, so it was 89 when I started college, because uh, I had a gap year there, I graduated high school in 87, started college in 89, and, you know, starting along struggling, trying to learn study habits, and all the things that are that are going on there, and, but one thing to answer, to get back to your question, and, and why this story is relevant, because we're still poor, you know, we're, we're taking out student loans, I mean, we had no, my parents didn't prep for college. They weren't putting aside, aside a savings plan or anything, right? And so I'm struggling to make ends meet as a college freshman. And, you know, they're not nice that, you know, Taco Bell was a luxury. And, and uh, man, finally, I, I, I grabbed a shotgun and a few, you know, 16-gauge shells. I had a 16-gauge. And I would go walk a fence row out in the country. And I didn't know whose fence row it was, but I was trying to kick up a rabbit. And, and that was going to help with grocery bill that night. And, uh, and I did that for for quite some time. And and then one night I'm walking around Walmart in Jonesboro, Arkansas, which is undergrad school at Arkansas State University. And I, I stumble upon the sporting goods store and uh, counter and I picked up the wildlife code handbook, you know, that lists all the seasons, all the dates, all the game you can hunt. And I just stuffed it in my pocket and took it home. And I'm, I'm you know, back at my apartment or, or dorm room or whatever. And uh, I started fumbling through it, looking through it. And I came across white-tailed deer in the wildlife wildlife game code book and i i looked through it i've i've never seen a deer in, in my life in person now i mean i've seen them in magazine field the stream outdoor life all the magazines we grew up with i've never seen a white-tailed deer alive you're and kidding I me across, no i mean we did not have them in the boot hill missouri and uh i come across white-tailed deer and i'm like man they have deer here around northeast arkansas around the jonesboro Paragould area and uh, started looking into it, and I come across, you know, I don't know what the gun season was, it's a week or two, and I flip another couple pages, and I come across archery, 
Well, archery season started like, I don't know what it was, September 30th, October 1st. It ran all the way through like February or something. I mean, so it was a long time. I couldn't tell you the exact dates back then, but it was like three or four months. Yeah. And literally my thought process was, if I kill a deer, that's going to fill the freezer. I can eat off a deer a long time. And surely in three or four months, I can kill a deer. I, I, I never held a bow. Other than, you know, some little fiberglass bow you buy at, you know, some little hardware store that has like rubber suction cups on it or something. I mean, literally. <laughs> not that. And, but but I start making these leaps in my mind. I'm like, if I kill a deer, I can eat for a while. And surely in three or four months, I can kill one with a bow. And I went back to Walmart the next night and I'm looking around and there's a used bear whitetail hunter bow. And, and this one. Is like yeah, that's what I had. <laughs> This is like a God thing because it had a quiver and four aluminum arrows and I think some old muzzy broadheads that were dirty and a br three brass pin sight that was that was rusted. And so what had happened? Some somebody some somebody had taken the customer service manager or something as a sucker and returned something. Some probably a four year old bow or something. You know, Walmart doesn't sell used stuff, right? <laughs> but here's a used bow hanging up in the in the sporting goods section. And I had just enough fourth, foresight to uh, ask the person, the clerk working behind the counter, I'm like, can I talk to your manager? I mean, I don't want to pay that price for that used. It's used. Obviously. There's rust on it. There's dirt on the broadheads. I, it was, I mean, who puts broadheads on a bow in Walmart anyway? And uh, so the manager came out. I'm like, I don't know. I shot him something like $60 or $70 for the whole outfit. He said, <laughs> he knew that they weren't supposed to be selling used bow. He's like, yeah, take it. And he sold that whole, whole outfit for 60 bucks to me. And I went and I I, I got a, a like a Gander Mountain or one of those, one of those little, those flyer, those catalogs that they sell, like dirt cheap catalogs or something like that. I came across one of those. I ordered for like a hundred bucks. I ordered a steel climber. I, I probably spent more on shipping than it, the climber was worth. And I got that. <clears throat> I found some paracord to pull my bow up with. And dude, I, I was off and running. And but I'll say I didn't kill a deer while I was in college, not not one. Uh, that's, that's how I started. God love you for trying, brother. Dude, I, I hooked up with a with a buddy who's he's actually a conservation agent now over in West Plains, and he was the first out of our group that killed a doe at Mingo Wildlife Refuge outside of Puxico. Oh, yeah. I've hunted there quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that, that's where I learned how to hunt is, is Mingo Wildlife Refuge, and you know. I, I never killed a deer there, but but I put in gosh 60, 70, 80 hunts, and yeah, it was just getting over the hump, and it, it got me started. Yeah, I'd heard that story before about how you come come across your bow, and I was like, well, that's original. I wanted you to tell that. Yeah, so. that's priceless. <laughs> yeah, so, there's, there's probably not too many people have that story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> You've you've been around the hunting industry for a while. Can you kind of give me like a background? I know you do some authoring, and uh, uh, I, you've got. We're gonna talk about this later, but you've got an awesome YouTube channel. So, can you kind of give me some information on that? Thanks, man. Yeah, you know it. It was slow but surely. Uh, you know, I didn't really become adept at bow hunting. I, I mean, I kept struggling, kept trying, and I think the <clears> foundation <throat> is is what gives me the platform that I've got today because. I, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. I didn't grow up where daddy had 400 acres and had these immaculate food plots and put me in a box blind. And, you know, a, a four year old walked up and it was an everyday thing. I did not come from that background. I, it literally happened as I said it, you know, so I, 70, 80, 90, 100 hunts without killing anything at Mingo Wildlife Refuge, which is a big public conservation area in Missouri where we live. Um, <laughs> Struggled for a while, moved up to Cape Girardeau, eventually went decided to go get my master's degree and uh, at Southeast Missouri State here in Cape. Met my now wife back then, and we started hunting together. And I've got a story in Peterson's bow hunting about that, is that, you know, uh, I we had been both in some, through some relationships. We knew what we wanted, what we didn't want. And literally the first date, the very first date, uh, the first question I asked her, we were 27 and 28 years old. We were older in life. You know, we it, it was just to the point where uh, we went, found some people that didn't turn out to be the right ones. And then here we found each other later in life. And the first date we're on, we're at a restaurant. And the first question I asked her was, when do you want to have kids and how, you know, how many kids do you want to have and, and how soon? Because we're both older and I realized that biological clock 
thing is probably ticking on a 28 year old woman and she is a, actually a year older than I am. And I'm like, okay, I, even though I'm, I'm ready to settle down, I'm looking at marriage soon. I really don't know if I want to have kids like next year. I, I, I need to ease into this thing. And it's a first date. It may never go anywhere. Right. But <laughs> Let's I'm just lay all the cards on the table. Did too. <laughs> we did. Wow. So, so that was question number one. Question number two literally was this. I can almost quote it verbatim. I'm not saying this relationship's going to go anywhere. We may never have a second date, but if it does and we end up becoming long term, I'm a bow hunter and I'm going to have mounts in the house. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> That was question number two. And my wife will swear up and down that that's absolutely the truth. I just didn't really care at that point, I guess. And and she looked at me, she she thought for a second, she goes, As long as they're not in the bedroom, bathroom, or kitchen, I'm okay with it. I thought for a second, I'm like, that sounds good to me. Look at God the love that woman. <laughs> and so but uh but so so I we got married after that about probably eight months after that first date and uh, and I kept on bow hunting hard and then all of a sudden you know I started having some success I uh, I started figuring some things out I started figuring out about transition areas I figured out bedding bed to food uh, deer or edge creatures a, a lot of things that you know that I employ today tactic wise and I started putting some really nice deer down one of my first really big public land deer and they're all public land deer. My first really big deer was a 167 and 4 8 mainframe 10 with split brows. And that started getting me some recognition. And about this time, somewhere right through that time when I got married was, you know, um, the internet really started taking off. I mean, like really taking off in, in online forums and bow hunting forums. And, and you got to realize that I'm getting my master's in English with an emphasis in teaching rhetoric and composition. I'm teaching as a grad assistant. I'm teaching writing. I, I'm, I, my undergrad degree was in journalism. I was an editor for newspapers. So all this background in communication, writing, expressing yourself verbally, and, and, and not only not really verbally at that point, but in a written format. And so the internet started to take off and all these, these bow hunting forums are popping up. And I start discovering them and finding them and, and participating in them. Well, at that point now, everyone is pretty, pretty educated in some of these forums and on Facebook and these groups and stuff. Back then, there weren't but a handful of us who could really articulate our thoughts and what we wanted to do hunting wise and the products we were interested in that we supported that we believed in and manufacturers set up and started taking notice some it reached out to me literally on they I, unsolicited some it's like hey man i really like what you're doing online uh you've already talked about you're already using our product we'd really like to extend an invitation for you to come on board and be on on our pro staff and i got to know those guys really well and actually went down to Alabama, took a tour of their manufacturing facility, met met the dad and and, and the son and every everybody. Actually, the son was the one who of the of the manufacturing of the owner was the one who reached out to me. And uh, I got on board with Muzzy and all these companies that realized that man, we need somebody who can represent us online really well and carry themselves with respect and not put down the opposition and the competitors so much but just articulate why they believe in our product. And, and I, I was really good at that. And so more and more at the time, at one time, I was on like 11 different process at once. And this was in the mid nineties. And this was, and I will say this, I, I love to say this, this was before the process thing went downhill and became what it is today, right? Um, today being on a process, not that big a deal. It, it, it's more of a discount buying club, right? Hey, get our process, you get 10% off. Or, or, or if, you know, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, if, if you show a little skin or whatever, you're on a pro staff, right? And mm -hmm. so we've, we've all seen the industry go that way. And, but way back then, it was kind of a big deal to be affiliated with a company. And, and so I, I got in with those and I learned a lot about how to represent a, a product and how to carry myself and, and all that. And then so, so that was really cool. And then I started writing for Peterson's Bow Hunting. Field and Stream asked me to reach out. I started doing a lot of stuff with Field and Stream on tips and tricks and things. And, and it all stemmed from that school of hard knocks, right? That that I, I just had to learn from the ground up. I, I had no idea how to tune a bow. I didn't know what a proper draw length was. I didn't know how to set poundage, nothing. I learned it all the hard way. And so that has really built up to the foundation that's given me my platform today. That's inspiring. Yeah, it really is. Really cool. And I've seen on your YouTube channel, I guess that's your shop there, maybe at your house where you sit there with all your gear in the background. Yeah, yeah that's really that's cool. 
it's literally in the room behind me. Uh, I have a lot of guys reach out to me now, and I, I probably get no kidding, four or five, six, seven private messages a day on on Facebook asking for advice, and people find me, you know, they, they find my YouTube channel, and then they find out I'm on Facebook, and they, they send me all kinds, and I don't mind it, I love answering questions, but but usually once or twice a week out of those messages, some will go, hey, do you have a shop, can I bring a bow to you? Like, no, that's just that's just for me and my boys, that's, that's my personal <laughs> shop, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I don't have an archery shop, not, not a retail one. Well, we have a mutual friend that that's how I met you, well, Brian and I, with a show we were filming for. And I was like, well, this is cool, dude. And then I kind of got to talking to you and Fonny a little bit on Facebook. I'm like, this dude knows some shit. Oh, this is crazy. So <laughs> over the last year, I've bounced several questions off of you because I've kind of got into saddle hunting a little bit. And uh, I don't know. I mean, the stuff you do with, uh, you know, um, product examinations and stuff on your YouTube channel. By the way, what's your YouTube channel? YouTube channel, so everybody can know. Yeah, yeah thanks. I appreciate that. So I, my YouTube channel is called Stags in the Wild, and it's just it's my last name S T A G G S. Uh, you know, I always thought, and I'm not really super creative uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff, but I always thought, okay, I love to deer hunt. A stag is, you know, it, it's not really a, like a deer but it's sort of but it's like a you know you got like red stag and stuff red stags and i'm like there's got to be some way to play off that name and i, I was honestly i was never smart enough to really figure it out <laughs> but, but, but but when i it came time to name my youtube channel i'm like okay we're just gonna it we just went with stags and 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 i didn't want to limit it to uh to any one thing it's like man we we like you talked about at the top of the show we like to do everything. We like to fish. We like to hunt. We like to trap. We like yeah. to canoe. We like to we're just in the wild. Uh, it, we're, we're not limiting ourselves to anything. We're just, it's just us stags boys in the wild. And so we just lay it on stags in the wild. That's awesome, Greg. I, I, I got to ask you this. So Todd, get, Todd bought a saddle last year. He tried it. And uh, I'm on the, I'm on the edge. I'm on the fence about whether or not I want to go that route or not. So, yep. uh, Kind of fill me in and uh, let me know should I should I go for it or not? Well, I, I can tell you right now, <laughs> he's like the godfather of this. You, you're, you're, I know that's you're why gonna, I'm asking. You can have one bought before the night's over. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, you you mentioned my reviews and my gears and stuff, right? What, one of the things I think that why a lot of people appreciate what I do on my channel is is I'm not really trying to sell you on anything. I'm gonna give you an honest opinion and and give you the information so that you can make an educated decision, right? I mean, really. That's where my channel shines on the gear review part of it, right? And we're, I'm really trying to, and we can talk about this later. I'm really trying to take my channel away from that. And you've probably seen this, Todd, that I'm, I'm doing a lot more stuff with education in the one sticking arena, right? We yep. got into that huge. I'm trying to, I've actually developed a playlist. I just dropped another video to this afternoon. I watched uh, it <laughs> about that. And so, um, so yeah, we're trying to do more education and tips and tricks, but but the foundation of it was gear reviews, and, and I just try to be as honest as I can because yeah, you know, I'm very fortunate, very blessed. Now we talked about how poor I grew up, uh, but but we're very blessed from a financial standpoint, my career, and and some of the choices and the way that God's blessed us. Uh, to be honest with you, that I don't need to to really try to be on a pro staff these days. I don't try to need to get free equipment. I'm not sucking up to anybody. I don't think so, anybody does. Yeah, yeah and so. You know, there, but there's a lot of guys out there that, you know, they're trying to, you know, be on a pro staff or they're trying to, you know, impress someone so that they can get free gear. And, and really, I'm at the point in my life now, I'm 52 years old. I, I, I'm way beyond that. I don't need to do that. So, well, Greg, the market, the market is so saturated right now with uh, no matter what channel you turn on, no matter what, you can't get the um, straight up view yeah. of it. It's, yeah. it's plug in here, plug in there. And, Totally agree. Totally agree. And and I, I've got about two or three. Well, I, I actually just ended. I, we did not. I was on Muzzy and Paradigm's Pro Staff for about 13 years. Very long standing relationship. Michelle Eichler, who is Fred's wife. A lot of you guys know Fred Eichler from yeah. Everything Eichler and before that, the East Outdoor Show. So Michelle, back when, I think even before she married Fred, she was Michelle, Michelle Masaccia. John Masaccia's daughter, the founder of Muzzy, and re invited me to come on board the Muzzy Pro staff. And I've been on board their staff until until this year. I decided not to reapply. 
Uh, great company. Don't have one bad thing to say about them. They mostly sold out to Faradine, which was a parent company of Rage and Block and Glendale Targets and all that stuff. So I had access to all that stuff. But uh, I, I don't really have a partnership. I actually just reached out and formed one with Buck Fever Synthetics. We've got a project coming up this year on our channel that's going to be cool with them. Uh, but I don't really have to have sponsorships, so which is super really nice. Um, but anyway, getting back to your question about saddles and just being bluntly honest and just trying to educate people, because that was the whole point of all of that, right, is that I don't have to try to sell. I'm not affiliated with anybody. I'm not working for any company. I don't get a kickback. I don't get a, a discount code to, to earn a percentage. I, I'm not doing any of that. So um, to answer your question, Brian, saddles. Uh, They've got their pluses and minuses. I have obviously chosen as someone who's been hunting since 1990. Now it's what, 2002, 32 years later. I, I transitioned from run and gun. I, I still run and gun, but I've transitioned out of cl steel climbers to aluminum climbers to lone wolf hang ons and sticks. And I've done everything. And now I choose to hunt out of a saddle because I believe it's a better choice for me. Uh, so that right there should tell you something. But, um, you know, I can walk into the into the woods nowadays with nine pounds of gear. I showed that on today's video on, that just dropped on our, on our YouTube channel. Nine pounds of gear. I can hunt any tree up to about 35 foot high. It doesn't matter if it's got limbs. It doesn't matter what the bark is. It doesn't matter if it leans. It doesn't matter if it forks. Uh, I, I hunted a place right outside of Reynoldsville, Illinois this year and climbed a tree that probably had four different forks. And I went from trunk to trunk to fork to fork to trunk to back. And I was one sticking the whole whole time. Uh, so people are, you know, it's so funny when they look at one sticking and, and we can talk about that later too, but you know, they go, well, you're limited. No, I am completely unlimited in that. So in walking in with a saddle, you know, it's two and a half pounds. Uh, I can, the good thing about, so, so let's, let's talk about what the pros of a saddle are. Two and a half pounds, no creaking, no bolts. You know, when you stand on a platform or anything like that, I don't have to worry about, I've, I've lost deer in the past because my stand creaked or it teamed or popped or rivet popped or whatever. I, I, none of that. Everything basically that I have on with the exception of something that's really super solid, this little 12 inch stick I'm standing on, it's fabric, fabric and rope. There's nothing to creak. There's nothing to pop. There's no rivets to hit anything. It, it's awesome. I can also use the tree that's in front of me as a blocker. <clears throat> so here's a great example. Two years ago now, I was sitting a field edge and I don't always hunt field edges. A lot of times I'm hunting deep in bedding areas. I can climb any tree at three inches around. It doesn't matter. But I, this particular night, I was on a field edge. The, the field filled up with deer. There were two little two and a half year old eight pointers sparring directly in front, probably 10, 10 yards in front of my tree. And they're sparring. And I don't want a two and a half year old. They're probably 120 inch deer. So they're clicking antlers and everything. I was after a double that night. We needed some food in our freezer. And, and, uh, so the doe started coming out and everything. Well, a doe makes her way right toward, toward us. And I'm on the back side of the tree. The two bucks are on the opposite side out in the field. Finally, a doe got big old mature doe, got in range, turned broadside about 18 yards. I literally leaned out to the left, came to full draw, popped the doe, went back in, and the bucks looked around. She took off running. They're like, what happened to her? And they're looking around. They were 10 yards in front of the tree. No idea because now I'm back behind the trunk of the tree. Yeah. And so if I was sitting a field edge in a in a hang on a traditional hang, or a climber, either one, a tree stand hunter, we'll just call it that, I would have been exposed on the opposite on the field edge of the of the tree. And I would have been sticking out like a sore thumb unless you decide to hunt back into the woods 10 yards or so. And now you're obscuring your vision down the field edges. Yeah. I can sit right on the field edge, but not stick out like a sore thumb. That's that's something that's really super cool. When did so, when did you when did you make the transition to the saddle? How long how long have you been doing this now? So uh, five years exactly now. I had a yeah. buddy a buddy a real good friend of mine who had one year prior to me, and I got sick and tired of the text he was texting me because we both uh, a lot of people realize this or know this from from seeing me on Facebook and everything. I, I put in over a hundred sets a year every year over a hundred sets every and I've done it for twenty plus years. I have one friend that I know in the bow hunting industry who does the same, who hunts as hard as I do and as many times as I do. And so we text each other back and forth all the time when we're in a tree and in the afternoons and stuff. And he was constantly texting me, 
Have I told you how much I like my saddle? Have I told you how much I like my tree saddle? <laughs> I mean, literally, it was like, okay, Scott, I, I get it, dude. And so after like the 15th time he texted me that during that bow hunting season, I'm like, okay, I started, I'm like, okay, I'll look into it. I, I mean, he was a good friend of mine. I'm like, okay, I, you got my attention. I'm, I'll see what it's all about. I started looking into it. I'm like, that gum, these saddles are kind of expensive. <clears throat> you know, they're 320 bucks, 350 bucks for, you know, there were only two manufacturers on the market at that time, really. I mean, there was a lot of DIY stuff. People were doing, you know, sit drags and comparing them with a the rock climbing harness and things like that. But there were really only two, really only one that had been well-established, Arrow Hunter. They'd been building stuff for the arborists and tree climbers and people who cut limbs down and trees down. And they kind of ventured off and made a saddle that some of the saddle hunters were starting to use. Bobby Boudreaux had helped to develop that a little bit from Louisiana. And, and then this new upstart company had just hit the market called Tethered. And right. those were really the only two mm -hmm. companies that were out. And so, uh, and both of them were like, you know, a couple hundred dollars for a saddle. And, and like I said, we're very blessed financially and everything, but if I'm just not going to blow a couple hundred dollars if I don't have to. With my riding background and, and all the relationships I had in the bow hunting industry and stuff, I'm like, you know what? I think I got a, I got an idea here. I mean, this is kind of, kind of a cool thing. I shot an email or a text to an editor buddy of mine who I wrote for at Peterson's Bow Hunting, and I said, "Hey, here's what I'm looking to do. And I, I, I'm, I want to check out this saddle thing, and um, if I like it, I'd like to do a big feature article on it, and all about saddle hunting and mobile hunting and how it's integrated, and how it's taken over the the world of bow hunting and mobile run and gun and all this." And he answered me within within the hour. Said, "Yeah, I love the idea. Go for it." Well, then then I could have able to go to the two companies, Arrow Hunter and and tethered and say hey here's to, i'm a feature writer for peterson's bow hunting i'm doing a freelance article on them i would love to try out your gear and obviously we're going to show a bunch of pictures of it and talk about it in in saddle hunting you know the, the saddle world and we're going to position it and help advertise the and market this concept well they were both sent me saddle kits for free to try and for the article and everything so i'm like man this worked out like a charm <laughs> you know so, so i saved myself all this money of, of spending it on the saddle and uh and then yeah i just i wrote it turned out to be the cover story for peterson's bow hunting and uh it, it turned out to be one of the, the longest feature article cover stories that they've ever published and, nice um, so, yeah brian you mentioned it and I, the one thing i will refute in case anyone's listening who takes offense to it you know you, you did kind of jokingly call me a godfather of bow hunting there there are people that have done it for years right john john eberhardt is eberhardt yeah he yeah. probably is the godfather. A lot of people, he is the godfather, right? And he's got, I've, I've bought two or three of his book, Pressure, Bow Hunting Pressured White Tails, uh, Bow Hunting the, you know, the Eberhardt Way and all that. You know, he's got yeah. some great books. And, and John Eberhardt, he's a very respected member of our, of our community. He actually called that cover story that wrote the most well written and most thorough art magazine article that was ever written on, on uh, saddle hunting. So I'm very proud of that and, and that endorsement by John because he's a great guy. Yeah. That's Good awesome. Deal. Good deal. That's awesome. I got it. I got a uh, a deal here. I like the the run and gun hunting, yep. really do like it. But when Todd and I get to Illinois, I'm one of them guys that I'm gonna all day set. Mm -hmm. So if if I'm in the saddle, what do you what little pinpoint would you recommend for an all day set to be comfortable enough to to do an all day set without regretting it? At, you know, six o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there, there's a couple things you can do. Is, is one, obviously, you want to make sure that you're in a very comfortable saddle, and and there's some very top tier saddles that stand out. You know, uh, I personally run TX5 Custom Gear. That's my saddle maker choice. What you'll always see it included in the top three saddles as most comfortable saddles. Cruiser is another one. C R U Z R. Uh, these are all made in America saddles. Cruiser is they they have an XD model. I've actually got a review of that on my channel as well as I do the TX5. Two of those are so and and their Latitude has some really comfortable saddles. Th those three always come up, but especially TX5 and, and Cruiser come up as some of those those the most comfortable saddles in the market. So one is you want to get you a good saddle that's that's very comfortable. And then if I was going to sit all day, I would probably pair it with one of the larger platforms, a saddle platform. Uh, that allows you to maybe stand up, take some relief off. You can do that with the smaller platforms that I use for my four-hour sits, three-hour sits that are more run and gun uh, in one sticking and things. Um, you can lean, you can, you know, a 
lot of people ask, like, what do you do to get comfortable? Well, what do you do as a tree stand hunter to get comfortable? You sit for 30 minutes, right? I mean, I've tree stand hunted for 25 years. I, I, right. I, I know. You sit for 30 minutes, you, your butt gets tired. What do you do after that? You stand up, right? Yeah. So you stand for 30 minutes, right? And you, just, you look around before you stand up, but then you ease on up and you stand for about 30 minutes. And then you get tired of standing, right? And you look around and you make sure there's not a deer corrupt behind you. And then you sit back down, right? You do that. You alternate your positions to change your blood flow, right? Yeah. Saddle, saddle hunters aren't any different. We will lean, we'll sit out at a, at a 45 degree angle as, and stand and lean out for a while. You get tired of that. You kind of let, maybe let your tether slack out a little bit and go into a sitting position. You're still in your saddle. The big difference between tree sand hunters and saddle hunters is <coughs> tree sand hunters have the tree to their back and they're facing out. Saddle hunters have the tree in front of them and we're facing the tree. That's really the big difference. Yeah. But but to answer your question, I would get a, a platform that's big enough. You want to you want a comfortable saddle and get a platform that's big enough to support you standing up and maybe turning a little bit and relieving that pressure of just you know walking around a little bit. Trophy right. line has one called the Mission that's fantastic. It's a little bigger. But if I was gonna go in for an all day sit, dust to dawn, that's probably the, the platform I'm taking in. That's uh like I said, I just got into it this year and was just kind of trying it out. And it's it's a learning curve, certainly. Yeah, oh, um, yeah. And I've still got some things I want to work out. I don't know that I could sit all day. Um, I've got some pinch points, some things I need to get adjusted. But but yeah. I figured out the longer you sit, the more you, you play with it a little bit. And the best yeah. thing to do is just go sit in the backyard and play with it. But uh, yeah. I brought a trophy line saddle and the, and the trophy line uh, uh, platform. And then yeah. – um, I'm not quite as advanced as you. I just use uh, uh, lone wolf sticks. I've got four of them, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I'm not. I don't have my weight down to nine point five pounds. So, <laughs> eight, <laughs> explain eight to eight point eight six, Todd. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> explain to Brian how you one stick because I watched the video today and it's um. I haven't got to see it yet, but I'm it, super curious. It's impressive, and then and then not only how you get up, but then tell him how you get down. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's the best part of it, right? So, so yeah, we were we were lucky enough to uh, to drop a video two years ago now, I guess something like that. It might have been a year and a half ago. I don't know. But my same buddy who got me into saddle hunting, right? Who kept sending me text after text after text after text. Well, he once he got me into saddle hunting, then he started to send me text after text after text about one sticking. And I had seen a video on one sticking and. I, I text him back. I'm like, Scott, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. I, you, you're an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, but, but what he, what he realized was at the time I had a 12 year old son who was hunting with me and we'd got him into saddle hunting because we'd, I'd let him try to carry in a summit viper. It was hitting the bar was hitting him in the back of his ankles as he was walking in. He was struggling yeah. hard to go up with it. I mean, literally breaking out in a, I mean, a flop sweat trying to climb with a Summit Viper. And then, uh, but he needed that gun, that bar for him to rest his gun on, right? Huh? And so, uh, so, I mean, it was just a, it was a nightmare. So, so, we got him into a saddle so he could use the tree in front of him to brace his gun as a gun hunter, as a 12-year-old. And so, we got him into a saddle, but then he was struggling unpacking the sticks climbing up with them and more more so packing the stiff sticks back up at the bottom of the tree at the end of the night i mean i was waiting on finally i, I was getting so frustrated i'm like here let me pack the sticks up for you and so we can go back to the car you know <laughs> and uh and i was relaying some of these these woes to my buddy scott and he go and i had extended an invitation with for to him to come hunt the, the illinois rut with me uh last year i guess it was just last year and uh so yeah time flies man but so uh he comes and hunts he goes i'm gonna show your son gabe how to one stick because this is going to help him so much to not have to pack up four sticks at the bottom of the tree and so we one day it was you know 65 70 degrees in the middle of the rut the week he was here hunting and, and you know we come home in the middle of the afternoon and he goes okay now's the time i'm gonna go show let's go in the backyard and show gabe how to one stick I just happened to have the foresight to grab a Sony Handicam 
and I was not trying to plan on dropping a video on YouTube or anything like this, this whole phenomenon. And honestly, probably 80% of the one stickers in the whole saddle hunting community today owe it to a stroke of luck and good fortune that I happened to think of to grab that camera. And it wasn't to make a YouTube video. It was because I knew Scott would be driving back home to Springfield, Missouri, which is five, four hours away from here. I knew he'd be going back home and I wouldn't have him here to show up, show Gabe how to one stick again. Right. So I wanted to record his instruction to Gabe so that when he left, if Gabe had questions to me, I can't answer him. I didn't show you how to one stick. Scott showed you how to one stick. I wanted to have it recorded so that we could pull it up on the TV on the big screen and go, okay, that's what he did. Right. Yeah. And so, so we're, I'm recording the whole thing and about the, you know, we're kind of, 90% 90% of the way through this thing, and I'm like, okay, this this makes sense. This is a whole lot easier and better than these other stupid videos I've seen. The way you do it, I, I kind of like this. And so that's where a whole progression, and, and I ended up just basically cutting an intro to the video, explaining this is kind of cool. We dropped the video on our channel. It's, I don't know, 85, 90,000 views now. It literally, it was the video that launched the whole one sticking. You can't get on a satellite hunting forum or group or anything without run into one sticking now and it was that video that did it all that video scott talks shows us how he uses a mad rock safeguard to repel with at the end of the hunt and this is getting to your question uh todd is is that he shows that that and, and so that video sort of promotes it it really wasn't trying to promote the mad rock safeguard but that's what was using that video right that mad rock safeguard that product has been sold out for a year and a half since that video dropped no I mean, kidding across america you can't People are ordering them from Canada, Mexico. You can't buy one in the United States. Every once in a while, one will come, you know, some some supplier will get some in. But literally, the biggest mistake I've ever made financially in my life is not knowing how big that video was going to be and getting a hold of Mad Rock going, I want 0.01% of all your sales from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So That's awesome. That's so, really awesome. So how you want stick is, you know, we use a little stick that's 12 to People will, will vary. Some our sticks are 12 inches long. Some people buy 15 inch long sticks. But it's literally a, a tube, just like a low wolf stick. Think of it as extremely shrunken. Yeah. So it's it's got a double step at the bottom, and and you we need you usually you want to have a like a two or three step webbing aider at the bottom of tied onto those steps. Yep. And, and then the stick is 12 inches long. And then we sometimes some people will use it just a double step at the top or a little mini platform or something like that. Uh, I would advise any listener who's even halfway interested this, go to our channel. We've got a whole one sticking playlist. We'll show you everything there is to do about it. But but literally you got a 12 inch stick. And so we put it on about head high with that dang, that ang that aider dangling down beneath us. We can take two steps and be standing on that little stick, right? And so at that point, you know, either before or at that point, we'll attach our tether and it's a 40 foot long, tether so we only use you know six foot of it or so going up the tree the 40 foot will come into play later so we attach the tether up above our head and then i just allow myself to hang and literally i'll put my one my left leg on the left side of the tree right leg on the right side of the tree and just rest myself up against the tree reach down grab the stick and we use a a, a cam cleat like a bolt would like you, you just pull the rope out and put the stick back up over our head and repeat the process, slide the tether up, hang, pull the stick up. And three moves, I can be about 21, 22, 23 foot doing no that. No kidding. Time. Yeah, it takes me about, I timed it one morning. Um, I, I wasn't even trying to time. I just happened to look at my phone. And when I got done, I was completely set up, arrow knocked, leaning back in my saddle, completely set up in 12 minutes. And, and I was 21 foot high. That's impressive. And the best part about it, you know, because there's a lot, most of the tree stand accidents happen climbing in and out of the tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are, you are attached to the tree the whole time. The whole time. Cause I'm, I'm tethered in from the time I take my first step off the ground to, to the time I'm, I'm hunting and then getting down to, to the second part of your question. I don't, even if you did climb with four sticks, I would highly encourage people to rappel down. We'd never heard of that growing up, right? Never. No one rappelled out of a tree until one sticking became a really big thing. But because I'm I'm tethered in at head high, when I get ready to come down with my mad rock, it's like a belay device. I can actually rappel with it. It's got a handle. When I pull that handle, it slowly lets me ease down the rope. 
just like you, you would see uh, people fast rope down out of a you know, 101st Airborne helicopter or something. And, and I can ease down, I get my stick, attach it to, to my hip, and then literally I just walk myself down. It looks like, just like Batman walking yourself down the tree. It doesn't matter if there's limbs, whatever. I just walk myself down the tree. And then when I hit that hit, I pull my rope out of the tree with a little dinoglide, a little attachment rope that I've attached prior to, to recoiling down, and my rope comes out of the tree. We show all that on our on our channel. But where it really super comes in handy is if, if you've hunted in December or January and it's icy cold or sleet or you're numb and your joints are stiff, your fingers are hard to work, it is so nice and reassuring to repel, just walk yourself down completely tethered in. If you slip and fall, you're not going anywhere. I mean, you might swing one foot into the tree, right? But it's so much better than having to either inchworm your way down with a climber or climb down four sticks to remove each stick as you go down. It's just, it, it's it's heavenly to repel down when it's icy cold conditions. I can see that. Yeah, it's, uh, I've seen these videos. It's cool. I don't really know that I understand it completely, but I, but I, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. And, you, well, I've seen the good. videos of your son. He uh, he does it. And how old is he? I'm, I mean, the videos are probably yeah. older. Well, I'm he guessing was, early he teens. Was 13, he was 13 when he started. And, yeah, uh, yeah just super, super easy. I, in fact, now he's, he's 14 now. And so it, it has – it was just a year ago when we did that video. And I am super – I mean, I drop him off sometimes. And nowadays, because we share on X together, we share the same joint account, uh, I'll drop him off and, and sometimes drive five, six, seven miles and hunt another block of woods. And my only request is when you get to the tree that you, and he scouts his way in, he's, he's such an awesome little hunter. Um, I'm so proud of him. He scouts his way in looking for a hot sign. He has no idea what tree he's going to, but he just go, he just knows he wants to go, dad, drop me off of those woods. And uh, my only request is he drop a pin when he finds a tree he's going to be at. And it pops up and populates immediately onto my Onyx. So I can see right. it on my phone. And uh, so I know exactly where he is, but I, he's 14 years old and I drop him off. I, he probably hunted 80, 80 different sits with me this year. And I know he's repelling out of a tree. I'm 100% comfortable with that. And I'm meeting back up at the road and pick him up and we, we drive off. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I could talk to you all day long about saddle hunting, but um, you predominantly hunt, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much strictly hunt public land correct yeah that's that's all a hunt i've got i've got one place in illinois that i access through private um but but i'm still hunting public land and every other place is accessing public everything so yeah 100 percent public land kudos to and you man because uh i i tried it i tried it i uh, i went nuts <laughs> the amount of people walking in on me yeah just bouncing around yeah. and uh i you know todd and i we've been very fortunate our whole life to have private places to hunt right. and i tried the public thing and i thought man that that guy's got a good he, i've seen some of the deer you kill and right. i thought he's he's mastered that yeah what, what's your secret do you just go in deep i mean i know you, you've got some hunting skills there too but um what, what are you yeah. doing to get the big deer? I mean, and, and get away from the traffic. You know, so, so there, there's lots of things um, or, or several, I won't say lots, but there's several. So, you know, back in the day, early on in my hunting career, it was going in deep, right? And, and then everybody started going in deep. Sometimes these days, and Dan Infault talks a lot about this too, you know, the hunting beast dude. Sure. Um, he talks a lot about it. Sometimes, you know, <coughs> he, he refers to it as dating the fat chick, right? You, you're, you're doing something you don't want any of your friends to see. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes it's sitting 20 yards from a parking lot and, and you don't want anybody to know that you're hunting there, right? Because everybody else has walked past that. And, and we've got, I've got a spot, I, I can picture it right now. I've got a spot that I pull in the parking lot and everybody, everybody that goes in that parking lot, me, me included, goes a mile deep. And, and and I, I've done a lot of shed hunting in the area, scouting, and some of the largest rubs, some of the biggest beds I've found are 75 yards from that parking lot. And so uh -huh. back in the day, it used to be going deep. Sometimes today, it's not going so deep. Uh, it's, 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 the bottom line is it's going to where everyone else isn't. 
those deer, you know, those deer have patterned the people, haven't they? They, they patterned the people. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, mobile hunting and stuff. I, I got to talk two years ago. I was at the Iowa Expo, Iowa Deer Hunting Expo. Now I talked with that guy who killed that. I don't know what it was. It was like a 300 inch. It was crazy. 227 inch deer. It was like one of the close to the world record deer that was killed in Illinois two years ago. I talked to that guy and I asked him, you know, we're just kind of BSing there a little bit. And he said, yeah, the reason I killed this deer, because I, he, he lived in West Virginia, he killed it in Illinois or Virginia one. And he came to hunt with some buddies of his on a lease private ground in Illinois. And there were like six of them there. And he was like the lone man out. He wasn't like, he was the last guy to show up. And they're like, well, we're going here, 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 here to our best spots. And they kind of looked at him as an afterthought, like, uh, you, you go over there. And just kind of like, they, they literally tried to shove him off it to, to something, you know, he did not get the be- the pick of the spots, right? They're like, we're getting the best spots. And oh yeah, you just go over there. That's yeah. how you got a big deer because they were hunting those best spots time and time and time and time again. That big, huge monster. Now they'd all seen him on trail camera. They knew he was on the place, but they could never figure him out because that deer had figured them out. And yeah, so they right. sent him off to somewhere. They just sent him off to the corner and that's <clears> where it was. So if you think about that story, there's a huge lesson to be, and it's a great story how he killed the deer, but it's applicable to all of us is the best place to do now is go to places that other people aren't. Figure out the hunters. Sometimes I love to go just, I love to go watch parking lots and watch where people are going, figure out where they're going, what, figure out the people's side, what trash and litter, what, where are they cutting down limbs? You know, when I cut that, if well, you're not supposed to cut out a limb, so I never really do that. But if I ever did, <laughs> <laughs> I take mud. I'll take pick up d- dirt and mud, right, over over a little sapling or something. I cut and and literally brown out that white spot where I cut that sapling down, right. Most people won't do that, but you can walk in the spot and see instantly where people have been hunting, right? Right. See limbs cut down and everything. I value that information as much as I do a fresh rub, because I'm like, okay. There's a dude coming back here and hunting a lot. I'm not hunting here. So, you, so that, that's one of the big secrets. Do you run any cameras on public land? This was the first year I've done it in probably 15 or 20 years. We did run cameras this year. Uh, I, we had about seven cameras out all year long. And it was really cool. Normally, all the deer, I've, you know, you mentioned all the deer that I've killed. And, and we're very fortunate. I, I've got over a thousand inches of antler staring back at me ar- around here. So in all public land, DIY, over the counter, you know, do it yourself, bow hunting, archery stuff. But not one of those deer had I ever seen before I killed them. Really? So yeah, not one. So that's pretty cool. You know, when I walked up on my big six, I've got a 137 inch six pointer here, mainframe six. And he's basically- Damn, that's impressive. (laughs) Yeah, he's a six pointer on a Boone and Crockett frame. He's awesome. I never laid eyes on that deer before. So when I walked up and saw him and got to hold his rack, I was just like, you know, it's just incredible. So I relished that. And I think that's pretty cool. But uh, we did run tra- trail cameras this year. We got to see some, we got to see some deer that caused me to pass. And that's the pro, that's the plus and minus, right? That's the, the yin and the yang. Yeah. I, I, I saw some deer that got my heart going. And I'm like, okay, that made me pass some other deer that maybe I would have uh, otherwise shot this year because I knew what else was out there. Yeah, I think we've all been down that road. I've, uh, I spent a couple of years passing up every single thing I could, waiting on one and never seen him, never seen him in, in on hoof. Yeah. Got pictures, you know. Yeah, I did that for a year and a half to farm my hunt here in Missouri, and sure enough, the neighbor put him in the back of his truck, and I thought, well, uh, I could have had a lot of other deer in between here and there. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Right? Yeah. When you're, uh, and I'm sure the public land, a lot of stuff that you've hunted before, but how do you scout something like that? How do you know if you've gone in too deep or should I go in further? Or, you know, you kind of you kind of hit on that a little bit where you watch the people and see where they're at. But yeah. um, as far as deer sign, what do you, on on public ground, the, I'm, I'm guessing that the deer are mainly pushed into one area after two weeks of hunting from the pressure. You know, it's different. I hunt. I hunt a lot of ag country and, and it's honestly, it's tough hunting. And, and you see those numbers of, of people in public that are coming from out of state, especially those people who see Illinois on TV, right? And there's a Pope and Young behind every tree and they believe right. it. And they're coming up from Louisiana and Mississippi and Florida and Alabama and every plate that you see in a parking lot is from those states. Um, 
and, and they get here and they figure out it's a lot tougher than what they thought thought it was yeah. going to be. And, mm-hmm. and here's the reason why it's tough. In the land, in the area that I hunt, it's a lot of, it's corn and soybeans and strips of CRP and woods. Well, what makes it tough with that is a deer doesn't have to go very far to bed down to be far, to be close to his food source. He's got food water cover in the standing corn when it's up and he doesn't, and when they cut the corn, he doesn't have to go very far to find head high CRP that's almost impossible to walk through. And he's going to bed 35, 40 yards into that off his food source. And so you push too far, you're, you're busting him out of there. So it's a, it's always a delicate balancing act. And I don't know if I could tell you I found the right answer to know how far to go. And I'm sure it's like when I go elk hunting in Colorado. My wife and I joke about it. We hunt in the, the northwest corner of Colorado. And we joke that I'm probably driving by a million elk to try to go kill the one I do. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like that with whitetails, right? is you probably walk past 15 good whitetails to try to get to the one that maybe you end up pursuing and chasing, right? So it, it's, there. I don't know if there's any right or wrong answer. What I, what I end up doing though is trying to locate sign of a big buck and then narrow, I know I'm walking past a bunch of two and a half, three and a half, four and a half year olds. Four and a half though, really, two and a half, three and a half, I don't really care a whole lot about. I, I see those come and go. I let those walk all day long where I hunt. I've just had a point in my career that a three and a half, 128, 130, he's getting a pass from me. But four and a half are starting to, on public land, a four and a half year old at my stage of my career is starting that one. You know, if he's getting close to 140, he's got my attention on public land. Um, so as a bow hunter. So I'm starting to look for that larger sound, the larger rubs, the larger scrapes, the, 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 the areas that I know offer the, it's just a different type of security cover that they use than the smaller bucks, you know? So that's kind of what I'm zoning in. Transition areas, I'm huge on edges within edges. Uh, if you can find it at some place that, that, you know, it's a transition area for, or an edge from, from crop to, to woods, and then you go inside and you find a thicker area of woods, and there's, there's always going to be a line, always an edge within an edge. That's where I'm really focusing on. And, and we find a lot of those areas while we're shed hunting. I, we come out bloody. Like a cedar, th- like a cedar thicket inside a hardwood. Bear, yeah, that's a great example. Or just something that's got more grown up little willow saplings or cottonwoods inside of hardwoods. You know, you, you'll see oaks and, and, you know, elms and all this stuff. And all of a sudden you transition over and you got cottonwoods and, and all this. And I'm not a huge tree forestry expert, but you, you'll, you'll just all of a sudden the woods get thicker. You know, yeah, and you just right. kind of look around it. You look around and you can see that, okay, we we went from sparse to thick, and, and then all of a sudden you you got you know maybe you got brush and you got honeysuckle and stuff like that. And now it's kind of okay. Now a buck can get in there and hide. You know, I, I could be fifty yards away from him and not see him, and, and that's the kind of stuff I start looking right. for. Cool. Well, I, I don't think we mentioned this at all. Maybe we did, but you're strictly bow hunting too. You don't rifle hunt at all, do you? I killed one. Well, uh, I killed one deer with with a rifle. Oh gosh, it was you know early nineties. I, I killed. I took Dad's forty four Remington Magnum lever action, shot a doe, and you know I talked about growing up gun hunting and, and BB gun hunting and stuff. And and you know I, I'm no Chris Kyle, you know American sniper, but I was pretty darn good with a BB gun and the twenty two. And I mean I I shot rabbits on the run with twenty two and things like that. And so I shot that first deer with that gun. And it just, you know, I have nothing against gun, guns, gun hunters. I hunt any legal method you can. Yeah, I was just deflated when I dropped that doe. And, and I'm like, that just, it did. And I was at that point in my life, I didn't need the meat. I wasn't hunting for the meat anymore. I was hunting for the thrill and the sport and, and the satisfaction of it. And when I dropped her, I was like, eh, it just, it, it, okay, I killed her. And I didn't, yeah. I just didn't want to be a killer. I just, I, I killed a deer. I just, okay, it's, it's over with. And so that was the last year I ever killed. I, I killed one with a gun, and I was done. And and that was 28 years ago or something like that. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, and you, I, ever since then, I've been a bow hunter. You, uh, we didn't talk about this either. And I don't even know, but I know this just from following you a little bit. But you pretty much strictly feed your family on what you harvest, right? Yeah, we're pretty proud of that. We were actually featured on NBC's America Now. It was a show that was Leslie Gibbons and John Stossel. They, they actually. Did a, story on us uh yeah we haven't bought red meat since i've been married 
uh, at a grocery store. So we, you know, we'll go buy pork and make pulled, pulled pork sandwiches, or we'll buy a you know plank of salmon or something like that. But we haven't had to buy beef at a store since I've been married. And uh, I, I do it all through bow hunting, uh, all on public land, all over the counter DIY. Uh, I usually end up killing, you know, I've killed, obviously now I've killed over triple digits. You know, it took a long time to get going. A lot, big, huge learning curve there, right? Uh, and then once I got, got it, things figured out a little bit, you know, we've killed, you know, over a hundred big game animals with a bow. And uh, so, yeah, I, we haven't bought, bought beef or, or any red meat at a grocery store since I've been married. How, how many deer does it take a year to, to to, to where you feel comfortable like you like if i've got five in the freezer i'm good for the year yeah i i have to kill three i have to kill three every year okay. that's bare minimum that and that is like being sparse and spreading it out and rationing it a little bit and not eating meat as much as i'd like i'm a huge carnivore i'm a big meat eater oh. uh, i remember this guy sitting you know, next like, to me that's all he eats <laughs> yeah like a lot of us i remember we got married. I mentioned, you know, I got married eight months after that first date when I asked my wife, you know, my, my, my soon to be wife at that point, you know, you're going to have a problem with me having deer mouse. You know, eight months later, I was married. And so uh, we had a lot of figuring out with each other to do. And she's turned out to be, you know, I was so blessed. It was a, it was a huge God thing. And, and, uh, you know, she's the most supportive bow hunter's wife I could ever imagine. And, but early, we're still figuring each other out. I mean, literally like two, two months into our marriage and she said to you know, I come to dinner and, and I'm at the table and I'm sitting there looking and there's salad and a few vegetables and I, I'm literally looking around the table and she goes, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm looking for the meat. She goes, well, I thought we would have veggie night. Like, we don't do veggie night. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. And so, uh, she she loves still that sort of her friend. She goes, I learned it. We don't do veggie night. <laughs> <We don't. laughs> there is always a meat on the on the table. And so, I'm with you, buddy. I hear you. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I have to kill three. I'm I'm comfortable with four. I literally the it's a kind of a side rule. It's like you know when I kill four, five is okay. We can start having friends over and doing barbecue parties and having people out. <laughs> and that, that's kind of how I go. Three is bare minimum. Four, five, I'll, I'll have some friends over. <laughs> well, yeah. Let me tell you a story real quick. Uh, my buddy here, Brian, just just recently got married, but was a bachelor for several years there. And I'd come down and hang out with him, and he he was like, "Oh, I'm gonna burn some meat. Come on down." Well, I'd come down, and we'd have pork steaks. And anybody here in the Midwest knows, or especially around Missouri, knows what a pork steak is, but they're yeah. delicious. And I'm like, well, "That's great." Uh, we got anything to go with it? He's like, well, I don't know. There might no. be there might be some some potato salad in the ice box, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. There's some beer and uh, some yeah. meat. So beer in a fridge, grab you one. Yeah, I mean, when you have buddies over, what else do you need? And then he said, "You gotta yeah. go. You gotta be silverware." And he's like, "Well, I don't want a dirty silverware. Just pick it up, and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Just gnaw it off." Yeah. <laughs> 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 Greg, I, I I do got to tell you, man. I take my hat off to you uh, for the public land hunting because, uh, like I said, I tried it and it, it was tough. It was tough, and uh, I I ran back to the family farm and I'm like, you know, I can kill them there all day long. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, but I take my hat off. Congratulations to you on everything you've done. Uh, yeah. Real quick, because we're coming up on time here, but I wanted to touch on this one with you too, because you're just kind of a renaissance man. You do a little bit of everything. I know yeah. you. I watch you in the summer. You and your and your sons just slay the hell out of uh, catfish on the Mississippi River. And the other one you're big into, and I guess that's probably about right now that you're getting into, is you're big into trapping, right? Yeah. So the season just ended this weekend, and, and normally I would have went out and, and caught couple dozen coyotes by now and, and several bobcats and things i uh talking about going back to the trail cameras i got i laid eyes through trail cameras and eventually did see in person a legitimate booner and i've never been fortunate 167 and four eights is my biggest i've ever killed so far i got to see a legitimate no question about it would have broke 170 maybe 180 and i chased him hard 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 and and did not even break the trapping stuff out this year until a week ago. We went and set a, a handful, less than six traps on a on a friend's farm, and caught a couple of coyotes real quick and and got scratched the itch so so to speak. But yeah, normally normally I'm not going so hard late into the year. I, I'm still hunting hard, but not as hard as I did this year. I mean, 
there was, I think between November, probably, probably the week before October to January 16th, there were less than five nights I wasn't in a tree. So, really? uh, yeah. So, so this one, you know, we always do a hundred sits. I did way over a hundred sits this year. And, um, it was, it was going after a world-class buck and, and he made it. We saw him after a season. He's, he's still alive. So, so we'll be going after him hard, but yeah, trapping normally. I love it. It, um, a lot of the, your, your bow hunters that you know really well, Tom Miranda, Fred Eichler, uh, you know, Tim Wells, there, there's quite a few, Jay Gregory. I mean, there's, there's people who really, they started trapping and then moved into bow hunting. We actually started bow hunting and then moved to trapping. And I love it because you're, you're matching its wits with a predator on their terms. You're getting, that animal can roam a million acres, step anywhere he wants to, and you're getting to step exactly where you want him to step. It, it's it's a one-on-one mono versus predator thing like no other it's so cool we, and and you're helping out the you know the the turkeys and quail and everything you know the fawns it, it's just super cool we love it we're very very passionate about trapping and there's a there's a whole trapping playlist on our, our channel there's lots more trapping stuff to come on our youtube channel too down the road it's cool stuff i don't know yeah you have a i don't if you don't want to tell anybody about it do you have an instagram page or facebook that more people because you've got some cool pictures i've seen the past too yeah so i i rarely get on instagram my my uh instagram name is bowhunter b-o-h-n-t-r uh i think if you type in greg stags it'll pop up too but but my name on instagram and i rarely i don't get on both on instagram very much but it's b-o-h-n-t-r on instagram and then you can find me on facebook at greg.stags if, if you if you type in greg's or not greg dot greg stags if you type in greg stags on facebook It'll be pretty, pretty. There's a couple of us out. There's a musician in Alabama named Greg Staggs. It'll be pretty obvious which one I am. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're the one hanging out of the saddle, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm the, I'm the one hanging out of the saddle, and it's not hard to see me with a deer. See. So, uh, real quick, before we wrap it up, I don't mean to cut you off, Beach, but you got anything for Greg before we go? No, nah, I just want to say thanks for coming on. Uh, definitely, definitely a big help to everybody. I know, I know, I'm tickled to death to get to talk to you. Oh, cool. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it, man. It's what, been an honor. What's the, uh, just so people can hear it again, what's the, and I'll probably try to link it in show links, but what's the YouTube channel? Because yeah, YouTube, YouTube and I'm not, channel. I'm not just blowing smoke up because you're standing here, but I got, and I text, or I sent you a message uh, this summer saying I'd bought a saddle and then sent you a couple messages asking you some yeah, questions. I remember. But everything I know about it, and I've been trying to convince uh, Dummy here to do it, but uh, I've learned from watching your YouTube channel and it's legit. And I will say this, and again, not trying to blow smoke, but you and your son uh, put these products to the test and you don't, like you said earlier, you don't have any skin in the game. You're just telling you what you think. Uh, yeah. I remember your son, I can't remember which one it was, but he was trying sticks and he goes, this one sucks. I don't like it. I my foot's too <laughs> yeah. close. And I was like, well, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we've got a lot of experience to pull from, so, you know, we're not, just trying to, you know, we're not trying to sell a product. We're not trying to put a product down. We're just trying to give you real world experience through a lot of years of, of you know, doing it. So, yeah. So the channel, again, uh, to answer your question, the channel is Stags in the Wild. That's S-T-A-G-G-S in the Wild. And uh, we've got some, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of cool stuff but with one sticking right now. That's going to that's gonna be about 10 more videos to wrap up that playlist. So there will be no question left unanswered about one sticking by the time this playlist is done probably about the time that turkey season comes around. Then we're going to go on a multi-state turkey tour. I'm going to video all that. I'm a featured guest speaker at the Mobile Hunters Expo in Southern Ohio, January, uh, July 29th through 31st. And uh, then we've got two super cool projects that I cannot talk about that I'm going to unveil on my YouTube channel this summer. Uh, going to be awesome. And so uh, it's going to be a big year on our YouTube channel. I can say that. And awesome. uh, trying to work in some catfish in there too, right? We'll then we'll start. We'll get the Easy Cat out, the big old Sea Arc Easy Cat, 26 foot long boat with a 250 horse motor on it, and uh, we'll run up and down the Mississippi chasing those 50, 60, 70 pound blue cats. And dude, we we love that too. <laughs> well, Greg, I can't thank you enough, man. You're uh, yeah, you're thank a, you, Greg. You're a cool guy to talk to. You're yeah. Easy to talk to. I just like listening to your stories. Um, uh, it's it's been cool. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, thanks, buddy. All right.